All right, welcome to session three of Stay in Your Lane, the Bible study. So we've kind of set the course here. of We understand what the lanes are, what's mine, what's theirs, what's God's. And whenever it comes to what's mine, we're trying to control that. Whenever it's what's theirs, we're going to influence it. And then whenever it's what's God's, we're going to accept that. That is the CIA we're trying to understand in every situation. But whenever it comes to what's theirs, this oftentimes is where the real sticking point is. We tend to want to fixate on the things that we don't control, on other people. Think about it. It goes all the way back uh, to being a a little child, and and you cared more about whatever you got being better than what your sister got than actually what you got. That was your biggest concern. You were fixated on on somebody else that really wasn't your concern or your control. This is a step of of spiritual maturity, and it goes all the way back into the Bible. There's a couple stories I want us to look at to kind of get the theological underpinnings of what's going on here. Now, first is at the end of John's Gospel, John 21. Remember, Jesus had told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said, there's no way this is going to happen. And sure enough, it did. And so after the crucifixion, the resurrection now, Peter has kind of gone back to his old way of life. Even though Jesus is raised from the dead, Peter probably thinks, he's done with me. I wasn't faithful with him through the trial. And so now that he's going to set up his kingdom, I probably have missed my chance. And yet, as the disciples are out fishing, Jesus is on the shore. Peter recognizes it's Jesus. He swims back to the shore. Jesus is cooking breakfast, a beautiful picture of how God provides. And then this conversation happens at the very end of John's Gospel. Let's start reading in verse number 15. When they had finished eating the meal that Jesus had provided, don't forget, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And so now Jesus is going to repeat in, in a, a trifold way uh, the very mistakes that Peter had made in a trifold way. There, there's parallelism that's going on here. And, and so he, he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And, and Peter now was hurt. <laughs> that's funny. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Now get the context of this. Jesus has just told Peter, here's how you're going to live and here's how you're going to die. If there's any moment that Peter should be solely fixated on on either what's mine or what's God's, it is this moment. But notice where the text goes. Human nature. Verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. Now that's John. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? So so Jesus is literally prophesying over the life of Peter, and he could ask any question in that moment. And he's already told Peter, hey, for some of your life, you're going to go where you want to go. At the very end, you're not. Peter could say, am I going to be famous? Am I going to make a great difference for you? Where am I going to die? Who's going to kill me? Anything I need to watch out for? Any advice you have for me between now and then? But instead, what Peter does in that moment is he says, hey, what about him? All right, I'm going to die. Oh, okay. That's a better outcome than he's going to get, right? And it's it's almost like two little children in that moment with one child going, yeah, thanks for the ice cream, but my brother's not going to get a bigger cupcake than I am, is he? And Jesus answered him, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. And what Jesus basically says in this moment is that other people, what God does with other people, is not our business. And yet I think so often this is the place that we fixate. 
we, we, with good intentions, want to control others to get them to make right decisions, to prevent them from suffering unnecessary sorrows within their own life, to lead them in a proper way. And, and then sometimes with poorer intentions, we want to make sure that we get a better deal than what they get with God, that we have a better outcome, that, that we're not being shafted in some way in some kind of cosmic game that is taking place. And, and we literally spend so much of our time fixated on other people uh, that we try to control what's theirs. And yet that's never been our call. It's never been our task. Uh, Jesus illustrates this uh, with a great way in Matthew chapter uh, 19. And so uh, we have this man that comes up to Jesus in, in chapter 19, beginning in verse number 16, and he says, teacher, what good thing must I do uh, to get eternal life? And Jesus is kind of caught off by the good part, and, and why are you even asking me? And so finally, Jesus says, well, I keep my commands. And the man says, which ones? Which shows his arrogance right there, complete misunderstanding of his own heart. And so Jesus kind of listed off the second half of the Ten Commandments. And the man knows what he says in verse 20. Nah, all those I've kept. And not recognizing that he had murdered people with his heart many times, and we reached out in anger, that he had lusted after other people, that he had failed to honor who he was supposed to honor. He had coveted, no question. But the man arrogantly believes he's obeyed all the Ten Commandments. And so Jesus answered him that question, what do I still lack? Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give them to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And yet notice what the text says. Verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth, and Jesus let him go. Uh, to me, it's one of the most stunning passages in, in all the Scripture for me as a pastor, because this man came to Jesus, and now he, he wants to be part of the kingdom of heaven. And, and Jesus says, here's how you do it. And the man says, I can't do that, and walks away, and Jesus lets him walk. And what he does in that moment is he respects the personhood of that man, that that man has the right to make his own decision whenever it comes to God. And, and Jesus, even though he had every right in that moment, Jesus does not force his way on this man, but instead basically says, if you want to follow me, follow me. If you want to reject me, reject me. I'm letting you now make that decision. And that's shocking to me because as a pastor, I don't do that. If the man were to come to me and said, hey, what must I do? And, and I were to be inspired by Jesus and say, let's sell everything you have and give it away to the poor. If the man were to turn and walk away, I would chase after him and go, okay, hang on, that was too much. What if he just gave away 10%? I would negotiate with the man now trying to manipulate him into the decision that I think is best. I would rather disrespect the man than give up control. And, and yet control doesn't work. Whether or not other people choose Jesus or not is not a decision that I get to make. And anytime I try to control somebody and I, I devalue their personhood, their own agency, I'm actually disrespecting them. And I think so much of the chaos that we experience in relationships is born from this. Notice how I say it in Stay in Your Lane, page 81. Respecting the personhood of others is vital in valuing ourselves and receiving respect from others. Have you ever had a, a boss who, who, who maybe didn't respect your decision-making ability, and so they would sweep in and never let you carry out your duties as you feel like you should? Did you ever have a parent who, who didn't recognize that you were aging and, and getting more mature, and so they tried to continue to treat you like a child? What did that feel like? It felt like disrespect. And when disrespect enters into a relationship, there's a tension, there's a frustration in that moment, and, and there's a break in, in that relationship. And yet the moment somebody begins to respect you, it doesn't mean they agree with everything that you're doing, doesn't mean they buy into your decision-making, but whenever they respect, hey, that belongs to you, it does not belong to me, what happens in that moment is there is a connection that is there. And here's the amazing thing. Now, as you and I attempt to control other people, we will actually lose influence over them, and we will lose control over ourselves. But the moment we begin to recognize that, hey, you don't belong to me, 
That decision now belongs to you. You have the right to do that. You are a person. I'm going to respect that and value who you are. What tends to happen in that moment is that opens people up to listen to us, to learn from us, to consider whether or not what we're saying in that moment is right and true. And as we let go of control, we actually begin to gain influence. If you will and I will, will take other people and recognize that they are not in the what's mine column, and we will actually put them in their own column, it will empower us then in that moment uh, through our example, through our words, through what we model to, to them, it will empower us now to influence them in hopes that maybe they will make a good decision. But in the end, whatever decision they make it is totally up to them. But to the extent that you and I try to control what is not ours, we will experience with others frustration, anxiety, we'll have this concern, this, this sense of helplessness, because we are trying to control something that, that, that simply isn't ours to control. It's an amazing thing how Jesus, our very creator, gives us responsibilities, gives us a what's mine column and category and says, take care of that. And then he allows us to experience the, the good consequences or the bad consequences based on how we handle that column. If God can do that for us, shouldn't we be able to do that for other people? And so if your life is full of worry, if you're struggling in relationships to love other people, if you feel this sense of stuckness, my guess is, in part, you are trying to control some things that you can actually only influence. And if you will let go of the outcomes and instead embrace the role that you can actually play. I get to influence this, but I'm going to leave the outcomes to God and to others. You will worry less, love more, and get things done.